<coughs> Our scripture readings this morning come from first in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to inherit, enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and holding fast to Him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Continuing our readings in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 32 through 44. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. See also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Word of God for the children of God. Thanks be to God. About the most difficult thing, I think, that we have to do as human beings on a regular basis is to make decisions. And depending on the day and the circumstances, some of those decisions can either be more or less difficult. Sometimes it's all we can do to decide how many cups of coffee to drink, and other times we can easily make decisions that can and do alter our lives or someone else's lives. However, without a doubt, one of the greatest abilities, I think, that separates us from all the rest of the creatures that God created is our ability to weigh factors, recognize different alternatives, then make a decision and implement an action plan towards some successful accomplishment of that decision. Now, as we look back on our lives, we 
realize how many decisions we've really made that change the course of our life. Where we were educated, what program to study, where to seek employment, who to marry, where to live, to rent or to buy a home, what kind of a vehicle to buy, what colors to, to paint the rooms in your house, how to invest money, where to spend vacation. It goes on and on and on. Folks, we, our decisions that we make have been factors that have brought us today to where, what, and who we are. Now, many of these have been difficult decisions to make. The difficulty may not show now at this time, but at the time they were made, they were tough decisions. All of those men and women that were standing up here proudly with me today are people who made decisions to serve this country. And many of them served, as I did, uh, in the combat zone. Decisions that we made. So, from the very beginning, decisions were made and decisions had to be made. We all know about the very first decision that man made in Adam and Eve to make a decision. They had a choice to either obey or to disobey God and we know the choice that they made. And we can recognize very clearly from that choice the repercussions that flowed even to us from their initial choice of serving self rather than serving God. And as God worked with ancient Israel through biblical history, many times he called on them to make a choice. One of the most notable times was when they were about to enter the promised land. And from this we can learn several notable lessons about choices and decisions that we make. First thing is we learn that there are preferred choices to be made and that not all choices are necessarily equal. Second thing is the one who gives the choices, and I'm not necessarily talking about God, but those who offer us the choices may have someone else who they feel is better suited to be chosen for the choices that are to be made. But we also learn that making choices can freely make, we can freely make less wise choices because we make choices. And finally, we learn that there are effects that will flow from our choices that we make, bad or good. Sometimes these effects can be incredibly great and at other times unbelievably devastating in our lives. David tells us in the Proverbs, they will call on me, talking about God, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They spurned all my reproof, so they shall eat of the fruit of their own way. The complacency of fools shall destroy them, but he who listens to me shall live securely. Now, we know that not all decisions carry as much weight as this decision. For example, if you go to a restaurant, whether you decide to eat steak or chicken, from a restaurant menu is probably not going to be devastating in your life. Whether you choose to submit to God or not, though, is. Through the Bible, this is a call to choose. And it's a call to not only choose, but to make good choices. And when we choose God, God moves into action and supports our choices help to help bring good results to our lives from those choices. Now, choosing is central to humanity. I've said that several times. That's something that we do all the time. And many of us who have been in supervisory roles at one time or another, or who still are, know that we not only make our own choices, but we make choices for others, too. Choices in their lives. They come to us seeking to make the choice for them. Usually when we make a choice, it ends the potential for other choices in that area. That's something we don't think about too often. The number of choices that we have, we have A, B, C, or D, and we make choice A, usually that closes out our options to choices B, C, and D. We don't think about that too often, but that's true. When we say yes to a choice, in essence, 
we are saying no to all the other possible choices in our lives. And often there is only one choice to be made. Now, you put on a shirt, you can button it from the top to the bottom, or you can button it from the bottom to the top. doesn't make any difference. You're going to have the same effect unless you put the buttons in the wrong buttonholes, and it's going to look kind of funny. But whether you button it top to bottom, bottom to top, doesn't make any difference. There's still only one way that a shirt can be properly buttoned. But do you know what the most important choice is that you have to make in your life? It's the decision that has only one right answer. And Richard shared that with you in the scripture this morning. Jesus tells us over and over again that we are to be ready. Ready. According to Jesus, being ready is a one-choice principle. Now, not every theological decision is as important as this choice. What Bible translation you read isn't as important a choice. The religious, domination, the religious denomination that people choose isn't as important a choice. Now, but being ready, being ready for Jesus' return is a one-way truth. And how do I know this? How can I say this? I can say this very firmly because Jesus told us it was so. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told us in his last sermon that he preached. Now, that shouldn't surprise you that Jesus would preach about this in his last sermon on earth. Jesus at that time had only hours left in his life, and he could have preached about anything he wanted to, about love or about family, the importance of the church, but he preached on what many today consider to be an old-fashioned, out-of-date idea. He preached upon being ready for the kingdom of heaven and staying out of hell. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear about that. They don't want to hear sermons preached about hell and about what's going to happen. But, you know, it's there. This was Jesus' message. And this was the story that he told about men in the field and women at the mill. Two men working in the field. One was taken. The other was left behind. Two women grinding at the mill. One was taken. One was left behind. So Jesus reminds us to be on the alert, for you do not know what day the Lord is coming. We have been, my wife and I have been talking about this. The grand, some of the grandkids came over yesterday and we were talking about all the, the devastating things that are happening around the world uh, militarily and financially and, and uh, as far as, as ethics and things like that. And always happens when we start talking about this, one of the grandkids thinks that I have some kind of a straight connection and say, okay, you know about this kind of stuff. When's this going to happen? And I said, why do you ask me that? I don't know. I know it's, it's a day closer today than it was yesterday. I can tell you that much. This is, and then the response is, well, how am I supposed to know when to be ready? <laughs> well, you're a, you're a junior in college. Put it together. <laughs> now is the time to be ready. Okay? That's the message of Jesus. You can be two of you in a classroom. One of you will be taken. One will be left behind. He said, well, that's going to be a mess. I said, what do you mean? What about somebody driving down the highway and they're, they're taken? Well, okay. <laughs> then in that case, you want to be the one who's going to be taken. <laughs> Jesus doesn't tell us when this will occur. And there's a very good reason for that because Jesus doesn't know when it will occur. We're told in the scripture, nobody knows. Not the angels in heaven, not the saints, not even the Son. God is the only one that knows when this will happen. So Jesus can't be any more emphatic when he said, be ready. Be ready. It might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be a thousand years from now. It might not happen in my lifetime, but it might happen five minutes from now. I don't know. You don't know. Only God knows. Jesus doesn't know, but he does describe what that day will look like. Folks, I can promise you, it is a day that no one will miss. Every person who has ever lived will be present at this final gathering. Every person whose heart has ever beaten, 
who has ever lived will be present at this final gathering. Every person whose mouth has ever spoken a word, all will be at this final gathering. All will be looking in one direction. All will be looking at Jesus. Listen to Jesus' words here. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. And you won't be looking to see what other people are wearing. That seems to be a thing that my wife does when we go to functions. She looks around, would you look and see? What, will you see what she's wearing? <laughs> she's wearing clothes. Okay. I can't wear this to this thing last year because I wore it last year. You wore the same thing. Like, who's going to know? Other people will know. Well, I didn't. <laughs> and I live with you. We won't be looking at what other people are wearing. We won't be talking about the jewelry that they're wearing or the clothing that they have on. You will only have eyes on Jesus. And he will be wrapped, we're told, in splendor, imploded in light, magnified in power. Jesus described that day with certainty. He left no room for doubt. He doesn't say he may return. He doesn't say he might return. He says he will return. And he is so emphatic about that, and I believe that to the point that there are over 300 references in the New Testament to his coming. 23 of the 27 New Testament books speak of his coming, and they speak of it with confidence. So his return is certain. It is a finality. It's not it might happen, it could happen, it should happen, it will happen. As Jesus spoke in Matthew, unfortunately... He also spoke about doing some dividing. That's the sad part of it. That's the downside of it. Mothers will be separated from daughters. Fathers separated from sons and husbands from wives. Now, those of us who have served in the military have been away from home, and we know separating people on earth is a sorrowful thing. It is. It's a joyful reunion when we're together again, but being separated from people we love here on earth is a sorrowful thing. But folks, separated from someone you love for eternity is something more than horrible. Especially knowing where those who we are not with will be going. Because we are free. God has given us that choice. That's part of being the people that we are. We're given that freedom of choice to either love God or to not love God. God gives us every opportunity. He invites us to love Him. He urges us to love Him. He came here. We're getting ready to celebrate his coming again and his birth. He, he came. He was born that we might love him. But in the end, the choice comes down to ours alone, yours and mine. Because for God to force us to love him would be something less than love. So God explains the benefits. He outlines the promises and articulates very clearly in Scripture the consequences for rejecting Christ. But in the end, leave the choice to us. Kind of like the picture we have hanging over in the other building with Christ standing at the door and knocking. There is no doorknob on the door. Christ can't open the door. We have to open the door and let him in. This is the same principle. In the end, he has given the choice to us. Why? Because he loves us that much. That he doesn't want someone by force. Doesn't want somebody whose arm is twisted up behind their back. He wants you here. Not because you think you need to be here, but because you want to be here. You want to be here because you care about God that much. So our task on earth is very simple. It's to choose our eternal home. And we can afford with some things in life to make bad choices. We can afford to pick the wrong thing in a restaurant or, or to buy the wrong thing, get the wrong car. We've done it. We've all done it. But we can even choose the wrong career. We can choose the wrong place to live, the wrong city, the wrong house. We can even choose the wrong mate and still survive. But 
This is one choice that must be made, and it must be made correctly. Jesus continually urges us to be ready, and folks, it's just that simple. Make that choice properly, and live that choice, and everything else will follow. But make the wrong choice, and, and make no mistake about it, by not making a choice, you have made a choice. By not choosing, you've made a choice. You've made your choice. And then, there's not going to be any coming back. There's not going to be any erase and do over again. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be any whoops, it's, uh, excuse me, it's too late. I, I want to be counted. That won't happen. Not in this case. Because the consequences are eternal. They are irreversible. And they are forever. So this morning, I will say no more about this. But I will leave that choice between you and your Lord. I urge you, be ready. Be ready.